uh, 2 Peter and Jude. And so if you want to get your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, we're going to uh, be studying from this chapter tonight. Appreciate uh, Richard Watson uh, teaching this class last week. Uh, and uh, we're gonna, we have two classes left. We have tonight and then next Wednesday to finish the quarter. So we'll get through most of chapter 3 tonight of 2 Peter and then finish that chapter and then the last six verses of the book of Jude that we haven't looked at yet. Look at those next week as well. In both of these letters that we've been studying this quarter, 2 Peter and Jude, we've studied them together because they have a lot of similarities in content, especially between 2 Peter chapter 2 and uh, the middle verses of the book of Jude. And they're similar in content because the recipients of these letters were dealing with the same thing. Uh, they were dealing with false teachers that uh, had come into the church uh, in fact, when you read 2 Peter chapter 2, these were false teachers uh, that were among the church. They were members of the church who had turned to these false doctrines and uh, were now trying to teach them and persuade the members of the church to follow after them. And so Peter and Jude, obviously both of them under the inspiration of God, write these letters to these Christians telling them, Jude says, contend earnestly for thee faith. Don't give up on thee faith. Peter tells his readers that they needed to grow. That's one of the key words in uh, the book of uh, 2 Peter is the idea of grow and that they needed to grow in knowledge. The word know and the word knowledge is found 16 or 17 times in the book of 2 Peter. They needed to grow in knowledge in order that they might know how to deal with these brethren uh, who were teaching and promoting uh, these false doctrines. And so here's this letter that Peter, uh, we, we've looked at chapter 1 where he told them that they needed to... to we, we call them Christian graces, which I guess I know why we call them the Christian graces, but these were elements that they needed to add to their lives, where he talks about add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge. And those eight things that are listed there are steps that we need to take and things that we need to add to our lives. And the Bible says that we need to do that diligently, not just half-heartedly. We need to add these things to our lives and do so diligently. And he promises that if we will do these things, he says, if these things are yours, and not just yours, but they're yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in your service of God. And you'll, be, you'll receive, chapter 1 and verse 11, uh, that, uh, entr that abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. So he's told them they need to grow. He's warned them in chapter 2, in, in all 22 verses of chapter 2, he's warned them about these false teachers and the dangers that they present. And so in chapter 3, we looked at the first couple verses of this uh, two weeks ago, but I want us to pick up and just as an overlap to uh, read through those first couple verses of chapter 3 and then uh, get about halfway through this chapter tonight. Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle. What was the first epistle? If this is the second epistle, if 2 Peter is the second epistle, what was the first epistle? Well, Y'all are quick. Write to you this second epistle, in which, so this tells you that he's written two epistles, and we have them. This tells you that he's writing to the same group of people. It wasn't 1 Peter to one group of people and 2 Peter to another group of people. It's written to the same group of people. And he tells them here that while, while the purposes were slightly different, in that the first epistle of 1 Peter was written because they were enduring persecutions from non-Christians from those who are on the outside. Second Peter is written because they're enduring persecutions from those who are inside the church. Similar but a little bit different. He says both letters have the same purpose. I'm writing to you this second epistle in, bit, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Were these things they had already heard before they read these letters? Yep. I'm stirring up your, your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful. Three times here, you're, to stir up your mind so you'll have a reminder. Verse 2, that you may be mindful, you'll be reminded of what? Where had they heard, where had they already heard these things? From the prophets. The things that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of your apostles. Who were the prophets in verse 2? When we hear prophets, we immediately think of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation. Who was Lamentations, by the way? Was he related to Ezekiel and Daniel? I mean, he's one of the major prophets, right? 
Um, you go figure that out tonight, okay? Go figure out who Lamentations is. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. When we think of prophets, is that who we think of? That's who we think of. Is that necessarily who Peter's talking about here? That they had heard these things already from the holy prophets. Were there any other? Those are the prophets in the Old Testament. Are there any prophets in the New Testament? Where, where were the prophets? Where, do we have an Isaiah and a Jeremiah and a Hosea and a Joel and a Malachi? Do we have those kind of prophets who wrote books in the New Testament? Is that who he's talking about? Okay, John the Baptist. What, what is a prophet? What, by, by definition, what's a prophet? One who speaks on behalf of another. Was John the Baptist speaking on behalf of somebody? Yes. Um, when you come through the, through the, uh, re, re, the uh, writings of the New Testament books, especially in, in particular, maybe this is what uh, Peter has in mind, when you read books like 1 Corinthians and you read books like uh, Ephesians and some others that talk about the spiritual gifts, the miraculous spiritual gifts that were given to Christians by the laying on of the apostles' hands. There's nine of them mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's nine of them mentioned in chapter 12. One of the gifts, the spirit, miraculous spiritual gifts that Christians had by the laying on of the apostles' hands was the gift of prophecy. What was that gift? What, what would that gift be? Did they have the completed New Testament? They didn't have the completed New Testament. So how, how were first century Christians, how were they supposed to know what the will of God was? If Jesus nailed the old law to the cross, and he did in Colossians 2.14, and now we're under a new covenant, and Hebrews 9 says that he's the, he's the mediator of a new testament. We're under the new testament, but they didn't have it. How were they supposed to know what God wanted them to do? That was the very purpose of these uh, miraculous spiritual gifts, is that there were those who were teachers, those who were given the gift of prophecy. What's a prophet? Prophet is one who speaks on behalf of another. Who were these prophets speaking on behalf of? Speaking on behalf of God. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Where were the prophets getting their messages? If a prophet has something revealed to him, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where was he getting that revelation? From God. These New Testament prophets had a miraculous gift in which they were receiving direct revelations from God in order that they might speak the word of God before it was in written form. Now that we have the New Testament in written form, do we need those prophets any longer? No. Those miraculous spiritual gifts have ceased because that which is complete, the completed New Testament, is there in our hands. So perhaps, and that, that's a long discussion on what Peter's saying in verse 2, he could be talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. More likely, he's talking about some of the holy prophets that had the gift of prophecy that were speaking. Would those prophets be speaking something different than what the apostles taught? Or would they be speaking the same thing? Where did the, where did the prophets get their message from? God. Where did the apostles get their message from? God. You think it would be the same? He says, I want you to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And your minds underline this where he says, I want you to remember the words that they spoke. How did, how did God reveal his truth? Did God reveal his truth in concepts? Did he reveal it in pictures? Did he reveal it in ideas? God revealed his truths in words. Why is that important? Why is it important to say that we have God's will in words? Who does, Don? If you've got ideas, concepts, if you've just got some ballpark figure out here, you can decide what that means. That's left open for, for a wide range of interpretation. But if God gave us words, then, then whose words do we have? We've got God's words. Whose ideas do we have? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
Um, and, and you see a, a great picture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 of, of Paul saying, there's no way that man can know what is in the mind of another man unless that man reveals that to him in words. There's no way that man can know what's in the mind of God except God reveals that to us in words. When the Bible says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, does that mean that all of the words of Scripture are given to us by God? Who, who, chose, who chose these words that we're looking at in 2 Peter chapter 3? God chose these words. I want you to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of your apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first. Hold your finger there. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 20. What are the first three words you have of chapter 1 and verse 20? First three words of chapter 1 verse 20, knowing this first. First three words of chapter 3 and verse 3, knowing this. Well, which one are you supposed to know first then? That's not fair. He says, know this first, and he says twice. Well, in the context, what are you supposed to know first in, in chapter 1? Here's what you need to know. We have the prophetic word confirmed. We know it's from God. And know this first, that nothing you read in the Bible, chapter 1 and verse 20, is from man. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Nothing in the Bible came from man. It all came from God. Know that first when you begin reading the scripture, write it upon your hearts and trust it and not what man says. Remember, he's talking to these people that are being confronted with these false teachers. God says, don't listen to what man says. He didn't give you the word of God. God did. Listen to what God says. Dirk? You can take it to the bank. You can take it to the bank. Can you trust it? You can know for sure this is from God. Now, chapter 3, knowing this first. Now, what are we supposed to know first? We need to know that there are these false teachers that are in among us. In 2 Peter 2 and in Jude verse 3, both of the writers say that these, that these false teachers are right there in their midst. They are from them. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. I think New American Standard, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago, I think the New American Standard says that mockers will come mocking. There's, a, there's an emphasis there, a double emphasis. That it's not just the mockers are coming, not just the scoffers are coming, but the mockers are coming, and what are they going to do when they come? They're going to be mocking. Mockers will come mocking. What are they going to be mocking? They're going to be walking according to their own lusts. They're only concerned about their own ways. They're going to be coming in the, in the days of the Christian, uh, Christian dispensation of the last days, walking according to their own lust. And what are they going to be saying? What are they going to be mocking? Verse 4, uh, where is the promise of His coming? These false teachers were coming into the church. And they were coming to these Christians. And they were trying to uh, build up some skepticism in the minds of these Christians. And they're saying to them, didn't Jesus say that he was coming back? Yes, he said he was coming back. Don't you think Jesus loves you and wants to come back? Yeah, I probably think. Well, where is the promise of his coming? Where is he? Jesus said he was coming back. He's not here. Now look, they say in verse 4. For since the fathers fell asleep. Falling asleep is a figurative figure of speech that's used throughout the New Testament to talk about people dying. Since the fathers fell asleep, who are the fathers here? I think he's probably talking about the, the first generation Christians. That's what seems to make sense in this context. That their fathers, that, that first generation of Christians. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. What are they saying? They're trying to, they're trying to destroy the faith of these Christians. And they're saying, you're Jesus. He said he was coming back. Where is he? If he's coming back, where? he promised he was coming back. Where is he? Nothing's changed. The, the end of verse, that, that verse, they're basically saying nothing's changed. Everything's still the same as it's always been. In fact, they're saying everything's still the same that it's been all the way since back to creation. Nothing's changed. So why are you really believe that this Jesus is going to come back? Nothing's different. Peter says that's what they're going to be saying. 
And Peter deals with that in at least three different ways. He gives at least three different arguments in these next few verses to deal with that. First of all, he says in verse 5, For this they will, this is New King James, For this they willfully forget. Somebody have something different than willfully forget? They deliberately forget. Ignorant? These people are forgetting something. These false teachers, he says, they are forgetting something. something. Something has escaped them. Well, is it just an honest mistake? Have you ever forgotten something? Maybe? No, definitely not. Is it just an honest mistake that they forgot something? No. What's, what's the adverb? What, how, is, how is this forgetfulness being described? Willfully, intentionally, deliberately. The idea of forgetting is that they, this has escaped their mind. They've closed their eyes to something, but they have done it on purpose. Have you ever forgotten something on purpose? You won't admit to that, will you? You ever forgotten something on purpose? Oh, oh, I forgot that. Well, I did it on purpose, but you didn't say that. These people have chosen to forget something. Well, what have they chosen to forget? First thing in verse 5. They have forgotten that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. How, how, did, how did everything come into existence? According to this verse and according to Genesis 1 and everything else that talks about creation. How did everything come into existence? By the word of God. When you read Genesis chapter 1, what does it say? God said, let there be light. How did it come into existence? By the word of God. When, when God created the heavens and the earth, how did it come into existence? By the word of God. How powerful is the word of God? By the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth, and this, is termino- this description is... It's the same thing we see in Genesis 1, but it's still hard for us to to picture. And the earth standing out of water and in the water. Now, which is it? How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? I mean, can you do that? Can you be out of water and in the water at the same time? How, How is the earth out of water and in the water? And the earth out of water and in the water. And then he says, and we'll tie verse 5 into this by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. What was made on day one? Do we need to sing the song? What was made on day one? You all are really scaring me here. It's like three people know this. What was made on day one? You all are really sad. Light was made on day one. We're going to sing the song in a minute, so straighten up. Light was made. Justin, you want to lead the song? Light was made on day one. What was made on day two? Firmament. That's a fun word. What in the world is a firmament? What's a firmament? It's an expanse. Good. What's an expanse? Oh, okay, good. So we know what it is, but we don't know what it is. God made the world. God made light. Here's the world. And God makes a firmament. God makes an expanse. What happens? I wish we had time to go back to Genesis 1. What happens with the firmament? With the firmament, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, start in, uh, uh, what is it about, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 11, those verses right in there where he talks about day 2. God talks about there being water above the firmament. Oh, it's a gap. Now we have another synonym. So we have firmament, an expanse, and a gap. Any other synonyms? Any, any other thesaurus people in here you want to throw it in? So we've got the waters above the firmament, and you've got the firmament, the expanse, the gap, the... Got anything else, Chuck? And then the waters under the firmament. You've got the waters above. You've got the waters below. What is, what is Peter saying? Peter's, Peter's taking them at their argument. Peter's saying, okay, Sure. You want to say nothing's changed since the beginning? By the word of God, the heavens were of old. And and here's what happened, that there were waters above the firmament. There were waters below the firmament. What are the first two words that you have in verse 6? Through which or by which? What's this talking about? 
He's talking about the waters that are above the earth, or the waters that are above the firmament, waters that are below the firmament. I'll get the word, the whatever. By which, what happened? Here's these waters. What did these waters do? These waters, what would you say, Jerry? These waters came together and overflowed. They flooded the earth. When did they do that? When God pulled the cork. When God pulled the cork, the earth flooded. When did God do that? Where do we read about Noah and the flood? Genesis 6 through 9. If you were to look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, where did the waters of the flood come from? The waters of the flood came from from beneath, from the springs, the earth opened up and the waters came out. And then verse 11 also says that the windows of heaven opened up. Where did the waters of the flood come from? They came from everywhere. So Peter's saying, okay, sure. These people say, nothing's changed since the, beginning, since the creation. And what does Peter say? Um, I seem to remember a story about the flood. That sort of changed the landscape a little bit, didn't it? He says, these people don't know what they're talking about. By which the world that then existed, it perished. Underline these thoughts in your mind. The world that then existed, perished. It was destroyed. Does that mean it was annihilated? Did, it cease to, did the world cease to exist? No, I don't think so. Did, was it annihilated? If it was, what are you living on? It's still here, isn't it? It perished. It was destroyed. Being flooded with water. But, verse 7, contrast, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved. There was that world then, verse 7, or verse 6. There was that world then. You see the word then in verse 6. Now here's the world now, verse 7. And here's the heaven and the earth now that are preserved by the what? Verse 7. They're preserved by the same word. What word is that? Go back up to verse 5. And, and you may underline in verse 5, word, the word of God in verse 5, and draw a line down to verse 7, the same word. What brought everything into existence? The word of God. What is it that is still sustaining everything today? The word of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says the same thing, that by His Word, everything is being sustained and, and consists. It's His same Word that is still preserving it, but notice He says, verse 7, that the heavens and the earth now are reserved for fire. God destroyed it once with a flood. What's going to destroy it next time? Fire. And He's going to talk about that fire and that destruction later in this chapter are reserved for fire. When is that going to happen? Verse, verse 7, when is the earth, when is this reservation for fire, when is that going to take place? On the day of judgment. When Jesus comes back. Reserved for fire until the day of judgment. What else is going to happen? The earth, the heavens and the earth are going to be destroyed with fire when the day of judgment comes. And at the same time is going to be the destruction of ungodly men. Or the New King James says the perdition of ungodly men. Are, what's going to happen to the ungodly men? What does it mean that they're going to be destroyed or that they're going to suffer perdition? Are, are they going to be annihilated? Are they going to be like just burned up and disappear and not exist anymore? They're going out of existence? No. Same word. If, if back up in verse 6, if the world didn't, wasn't annihilated... Then in verse, in verse 7, the people are not annihilated. They don't cease to exist. And the reason we, we, we point that out, and we can point that out here, we could go to 2 Thessalonians, and if you take notes in the margin of your Bible, you might write next to where the ungodly suffer perdition, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, because there it also talks about this fact. There are those who believe that, that those who are um, condemned to hell are going to be annihilated. Meaning when they go to hell, they're just going to be burned up by the fire and cease to exist. But that's not what the Bible teaches, is it? 
You read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9 says that these will, these will, be, these will suffer uh, everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Does that mean they're going to be annihilated? Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, Jesus says, These shall go away into everlasting punishing. I know we usually use the noun punishment, but the word there is punishing. These will go away into everlasting punishing. How long is the punishing going to last? Everlasting. What's going to be happening to everlasting? They're going to be punished. That's not going to be annihilated. It's going to be an eternity of being punished. And so Peter says that these are reserved for fire as well as the, the time will come at this very same time where the ungodly men. What ungodly men do you think the readers of this letter would immediately think of? The false teachers. These people that are causing them so much harm, the same thing Peter's been saying since chapter 1 where he talked about their destruction is coming. He's still saying here that their destruction is coming. But, verse 8, here's the second argument that Peter makes. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing. Sounds like verse 3, doesn't it? Knowing this first, and then he gets down to verse 5, this they willfully forget. And then he says in verse 8, But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Why is he saying that? What are the scoffers saying? Where's the promise of the coming of the Lord? He said he was coming back. Hello, he's not here. Why isn't he here? Why hasn't he come back yet? These, these mockers who will come mocking, they're looking at this promise and they're looking at the fulfillment of this promise on their timeline. They're looking at it through their own eyes. What's Peter saying in verse 8? Does God see things differently than we do? Is, does, God, does God look at time the same way that we do? No. Chuck? What did the few millennium say about the thousand years? Well, there, there are those, as Chuck asked, there are those who misuse. It's interesting that when we get to verses 15 and 16 of this chapter, it talks about those who twist to their own destruction the Word of God. There are those who come to this verse and they say that uh, they take this as an equation. And they take verse 8 to say, with God, one day equals a thousand years. And a thousand years equals one day. Is that what this verse says? Do you have the word equals? Or is it exactly two? Or can be, uh, can be uh, uh, compared to? It says it is as. What is that? What is the word as? It's a simile. You're not even an English teacher. It's a simile. Go... It, maybe you already have this as a marginal reading. Uh-oh, here comes Stephen. Um, I thought he was coming to correct our English lesson. It, you may already have this as a marginal reading, but the quotation uh, that this is coming from is in, in Psalm 90 and verse 4. In Psalm 90 and verse 4, it uses the word like. Here in this verse, it uses the word as, but it says the same thing. With God, a day is like a thousand years, and a, a thousand years is like one day. That's not, that's not to say this is, this is some equation for us to work with. Peter's argumentation is, don't put things on your own timeline. Did, uh, did Abraham and Sarah try to put the promise of God into their own timeline? Oh, boy, we don't have a son yet. Here, let's fix this. You, you go and sleep with my handmaiden, we'll have a child, and that can be your son. No, uh-uh. That's not God's timeline. How long, how long was it before Abraham had that promised son? 25 years. That's a long time when you go from 75 to 100, isn't it? That's not my timeline, but that's God's timeline. When did they get the land? Hundreds of years later. When, did, when was that seed promise fulfilled? 1,900 years later when Jesus came. If we put things on our timeline, something's wrong. Something's going to happen. When the Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. If we put that on our timeline, we put it in our time frame, when we want it to work out for good, are we going to get angry with God? God, you said you were going to work out everything for good in my life. Where is it? Is there a timeline in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 when God says that? 
There's no timeline. God sees things much differently than we do. To God, the passing of time can be like a day or a passing of time can be like a thousand years. But God sees the big picture. You and I have got tunnel vision. We can only see life through our eyes. We can only see life on our timeline. God sees the whole picture. That's, that's why the prov- we need to trust in the providence of God that God is going to take care of us in His providence because He knows better than we do. And when we pray and we pray, Thy will be done. Why do we pray that? Because God can see the big picture and we can't. God knows better what we need than we, than we know ourselves, doesn't He? Dirk? Right, right. The, the, the verse goes both directions. That, that, that to God a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And, and, and it, it, it flows it both ways. But here, here's, here's Peter's point. Did Jesus promise that he was going to come back? Yes. Has everything stayed the same since creation? No, I think there was a thing called the flood that disrupted everything. Point number two in verse eight. Don't put things on your timeline. Jesus said He was going to do it. He will do it. God made a promise, and God is good for His promise. He is not forgotten. Now look in verse 9. Some people's favorite verse is verse 9. Here's argument number 3. The Lord is not slack or slow concerning His promise, as some count slackness or slowness. Peter's saying, hey, these people over here, they're saying God's a little slow on fulfilling this promise. He says, God is not slow. God is not slack. Concerning, and, and notice that the promise here is, is singular. What did they, what is, promise is singular in verse 4. Where is the promise of His coming? Verse 9, the Lord is not slow concerning His promise. Specifically, verse 9 is talking about the promise of the coming of Jesus. Now, can we make application and say that God is not slow concerning any of His promises? Is God slack with any of His promises? God will fulfill all of His promises. But specifically, God is not slack or slow with this promise of the sending of His Son. Notice what Peter says to these people. But instead of being slow or slack, what is God? He is long-suffering to usward. Why? Why? Why is God patient, friend? Okay, he wants to make sure that people like Chuck's brother have a chance. He is long suffering to usward, not willing that, what's the next word? Any should perish, but that, what's the next word? All should come to repentance. What? Here, here are these. Here are these mockers mocking, saying, oh, where's Jesus? He said he was coming back. He said he was coming back. He said he was coming back. Jesus isn't back yet. You don't believe in this Jesus, do you? And Peter's third argument, and depending on how you count these, Peter's third argument is God is not slow concerning his promise. And it's almost as if Peter turns the finger at, at these mockers and says, hey, guys, take advantage of God being slow in fulfilling this promise. You're out there mocking, 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 putting your face in the face of God. And he says, hey, hey, hey. God's not slow concerning His promises. Some man counts slackness, but He's long-suffering to us. He's not willing that any should perish, even you mockers. He's not even willing that you should perish, but that all, including you mockers, should come to repentance. Does God want anybody to go to hell? Good. So that means nobody's going to hell, right? Because he, he doesn't want anybody to go to hell, so nobody's going to go to hell, right? Is that what this verse teaches? Uh-uh. Uh, He's made promises, hasn't he? Does this verse teach that God would never send anybody to hell? No. Look at the word willing. God is not willing. He doesn't wish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Do we have any evidence of that? He sent his son into the world. Who did Jesus die for? Everybody. Tasted death for everyone. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. He sent His Son to die for all of mankind. He doesn't want anybody to perish. But what's the word you have after perish? 
but. Here's the contrast. God doesn't want this to happen. But what does he want? He's not willing that it should perish, but that all. What does he want to happen? That all should come to repentance. Seems like Jesus said something about repentance, didn't he? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, Luke 13, except you repent, you will, you will, what's the next word? You will all likewise perish. Is that true? If I don't repent, I will perish. What if I do repent? I won't perish. God doesn't want anybody to perish. How do I not perish? I've got to repent. What if I choose not to repent? What if I choose to continue living an ungodly life? What if I continue to choose to to live my own way? Will I perish? Go back to that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 where it says that Jesus will return in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God has given us opportunities. And God has been patient. How many years did He give before He flooded the earth? When He came and warned them in Genesis 6 and told Noah to build the ark, how many years did He give them? 120 years. Peter says... That the divine long-suffering of God waited. We looked at this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Peter says the divine long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Waited 120 years before he flooded the earth. God kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for people to repent. Did they ever do it? How many people were saved in the flood? Eight people. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. God has been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and His divine long-suffering is waiting and waiting and waiting. Why does He keep waiting? Here's these mockers. Where's Jesus? He hasn't come back yet. Why does He keep waiting? So that even those mockers can be saved. God doesn't want anybody to perish. But that all should come to repentance. What's the first word you have in verse 10? We're going we're to look at the, the first part of this verse and then we'll pick up here next time. What's the first word you got in verse 10? But God doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But He wants all to come to repentance. His divine long-suffering is waiting and waiting and waiting. But is it going to wait forever? Is the long-suffering of God, can we count on it to be here forever? Nope. First word of verse 10. But the day of the Lord, what's the next word? Will come. What does that tell you? Is it guaranteed? Certain? The day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. Is Jesus going to... The promise is Jesus is going to come back. The mockers say, where is he? He hasn't come back yet. God says, he's coming, but when is he coming? When is Jesus coming? What day? What hour? No one knows. Only the Father. He's going to come, as Jesus taught in Matthew 24, as Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians 5, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, and verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What does that mean? We know He's coming, but we have no clue when. Should that affect the way that we live? Should that affect the decisions that we make? Should that affect the choice that we make whether to repent or not? Should that affect how long we wait to repent? When's the Lord going to come? Is He going to come? Guaranteed. We have no clue when. That phrase, the day of the Lord, is used throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, as an expression to talk about the judgment of God. God's judgment will come guaranteed but we have no idea when it's going to happen. So what does that tell us? We'll look at this next week. But he says, what manner of persons ought we to be? What kind of people? Holy conduct, holy living. That's what we've got to do. We'll pick up in verse 10, finish this chapter, and finish the last part of Jude next week.